Before receiving training in musketry, the individual soldier should have completed thorough training in rifle marksmanship. This should be followed with a thorough course in automatic rifle marksmanship. Training in the various movements of extended order drill and instruction in drill and combat signals are essential before beginning a course in musketry. This ensures teamwork and control of the unit in field exercises where control by voice is difficult. The rifle squad and the rifle section are the fire unit as their collective fire in battle is always under the immediate and effective control of their leader. The application and control of collective fire of rifle units is called musketry. Musketry training is divided into five consecutive steps. These are range estimation, target designation, landscape target firing, rifle firing its effect, field firing, No matter how well rifles are aimed, the resultant hits are dependent upon the accuracy of the estimated range to the targets. Range estimation applies to all weapons. The fire with a range either greater or less than the true range to the target will result in the target not being hit, will waste ammunition, and disclose your own position to the enemy. The three methods used to estimate ranges are estimation by eye, use of tracer bullets, and observation of fire. The method most commonly used is estimation by eye. The individual soldier is first taken out on the ground and made familiar with the appearance of a 100-yard unit of measure on the ground. Markers are placed at 100-yard intervals up to 500 yards over varied ground. All men are required to become thoroughly familiar with the appearance of the unit of measure from the prone, kneeling, and standing positions at the various ranges. They study the appearance of the unit at distances of 100, 200, 300, and 400 yards from a position on the line of markers extended and from positions to the side of this line. Ranges for each 100 yards up to 900 yards are accurately measured and marked. The men are placed about 25 yards to one side of the prolonged line of markers. They place their hats or other objects before their eyes so as to cover from view all of the markers. They apply the 100 yard unit of measure five times along a straight line in the general direction but slightly to one side of the markers. When the 500 yard point is estimated, the cover is removed from in front of the eyes and the estimations are checked against the markers. Accuracy is gained by repeating the exercise. Each soldier has now become familiar with the appearance of the 100 yard unit of measure on varied terrain and applied from different positions. He has been provided with a mental unit of measure which he can apply to the ground in the same manner that a carpenter measures the length of a board. By applying the 100 yard unit of measure to the ground, the soldier is able to estimate ranges to various targets up to 500 yards. Application of the mental unit to ranges in excess of 500 yards is difficult, and the method of estimating ranges in excess of 500 yards is to select some point which is estimated to be one half the distance to the target and then estimate the range to this point. Multiply this result by two. When much of the ground between the observer and the target is hidden from view, the application of the unit of measure will be impossible. In such cases, the range is estimated by the appearance of objects. When the appearance of objects is used as a basis of range estimation, the observer must make allowance for certain optical illusions. Objects seem near in a bright light. When observed over a uniform surface or over a depression, most of which is hidden, 
objects seem farther away when observed in a poor light. When on high ground, observed upward from lower ground, and when viewed over a depression, most of which is visible. The individual soldier and all leaders must be able to orally designate or point out and describe accurately the target or targets upon which collective fire is to be applied. The quickest, simplest, and best method should be used. Battlefield targets are generally indistinct, and unless their position and extent can be shown to the troops and understood by them, the fire of the unit will have little or no effect. All members of the unit must be familiar with military and topographical terms as a knowledge of terrain features is essential in locating and describing targets. Some of the principal terrain features are crossroads, topographical crest, military crest, horizon or skyline, ravine or gully, road fork, The three methods by which targets may be designated are tracer bullets, pointing, and oral description. Tracer bullets are the quickest, surest, and simplest means of designating a target. Their use, however, discloses our position to the enemy, and in case it is desired to bring a sudden burst of surprise fire on the enemy, some other method of target designation should be used. Scouts or leaders designate targets. The corporal designates a point target. Range, 400. Watch my tracers. The target represents a machine gun. By watching the tracers, the squad picks up the target and opens fire. If the target has width, the flanks are indicated by tracer bullets. A scout indicates the left flank, the right flank. The target having been designated, the squad begins to fire. The target may be pointed out by use of the arm for pointing, supplemented by an oral description of the target. The corporal observes to see that the soldier is firing on the designated target. In designating a target with the rifle, the rifle is canted to the right and aimed at the target. The head is then straightened up without moving the rifle to permit the soldier to look over the squad leader's shoulder and to look through the sights and pick up the target. When the bayonet is used as a rest for the rifle, it is stuck in the ground at an angle of 45 degrees. The rifle is rested on the hilt of the bayonet and pointed at the target. Targets may be designated by quick, simple, oral description. Pointing is generally used in combination with this method. The three elements in oral target designation are range, direction, and nature of target. These elements are always given in the same sequence. When the range is announced, the soldier sets his sights before looking at the target. There is, however, one and only one exception to this rule. When the target is expected to be visible for a very short time, it is pointed out before it disappears. The range announced was 400 yards. The sights having been set at the announced range, the direction to the target must be given as to your front, to your right front, to your left front, to your right flank, 
or to your left flank, as the case may be. The announced direction was the right flank, and the description of the target was group of enemy. Having this information, he readily picks up the enemy and opens fire. When the target is not easily visible and is not located at some prominent point, the direction to the target is indicated by a reference point. A prominent point is selected. In this case, the church spire is selected as a reference point. This being in line with the target, an enemy machine gun is located in the forward edge of the wood, 450 yards from the observer. To designate this target, the oral description would be range 450, reference church spire to your front, target machine gun in edge of woods. Where no suitable reference point is available in line with a target, one must be selected elsewhere, as it will be either to the right or to the left of the target the angle formed by the difference in direction between the reference point and the target must be measured. The raised sight leaf held about 14 inches from the eye may be used as a unit of measure. This unit of measure is called a sight. To get the correct position for the rifle in measuring sight, the observer stands 20 feet from a wall on which vertical lines are painted one foot apart and are one sight apart when viewed from the observer's position. The correct distance from the rifle sight leaf to the eye is determined for each individual by pointing the rifle at a vertical line on the wall and moving the eye along the stock until the raised sight leaf exactly covers the space between two of the vertical lines. The position of the eye with reference to the stock is carefully noted or marked on the stock. In this situation, the target is located to the right of the reference point. The observer has measured the difference in direction by pointing the rifle in the direction of the reference point and found that when the left edge of the raised sight leaf was in line with the reference point, the right edge was in line with the target. Then the target is one sight to the right of the reference point and is announced as right one sight. If the sight can be applied one and one half times in the above manner, the target is right one and one half sight, and so on. Similarly, the measurement may be made when the target is to the left of the reference point. While it is less accurate, the soldier is, however, trained to use finger widths in measuring sight. He is instructed to hold his hand palm to the rear and fingers pointing upward at such distance from the eye that each finger will measure one sight on the wall. He then lowers his hand to his side without changing the angle of the wrist or elbow and notes the exact point at which the hand strikes the body. By placing his hand at this point and raising his arm to the front without changing the angle of the wrist or elbow, his hand will be in the correct position for measuring sight by fingers. In addition to measuring the angular difference between the reference point and the target by sight, the width and extent of targets may be measured in the same manner. For example, range 400, reference left edge of church, left two sight, target edge of woods, extending left two sight, enemy groups. Successive reference points may be used instead of sight measurements from one reference point. For example, range 600, reference church spire. To the right and at a shorter range, group of trees. To the right and at the same range, target, machine gun at right end of mound. A combination of sight measurement and successive reference points may also be used. The simplest method of target designation should always be employed.
The squad, having made satisfactory progress in the preceding steps, is now ready to be given practice in the application of these lessons by firing at landscape targets. A landscape target is a panoramic picture of a landscape and is of such size that all or nearly all of the salient features will be recognizable at a distance of 1,000 inches. The standard target is the Series A target of five sheets in black and white. In order to make all elements of target designation complete, small cards on which are painted appropriate numbers representing yards of range are tacked along one or both edges of a series of panels. In order to provide a target for zeroing rifles, the right-hand panel is replaced temporarily by a blank target with a row of seven one-inch square black pasters about six inches from and parallel with the bottom edge of the target. Firing on landscape targets usually should be done with caliber 22 rifles equipped with Lyman sights. Where caliber 22 rifles are not available, the present service rifle, caliber 30, may be used for firing on outdoor ranges. When caliber 22 rifles are used, the instructor causes each fire to set his sights at zero elevation and zero windage. When service rifles are used, the sights are set at 100 yards elevation and zero windage. Sights of all rifles are blackened. A carbide lamp or a bottle containing kerosene with a cloth wick may be used for this purpose. The squad leader checks to see that all men have their front and rear sights properly blackened. The instructor checks all rifles to see that the sights are correctly set. Then the men take their places on the firing point. In all firing for zeroing, sandbag rests are used. Each man is assigned as an aiming point the particular small black paster which corresponds to his position in the squad. At the command of the instructor, rifles are loaded with three rounds only. At the command, three rounds, fire at will, each man fires three shots at his paster. When the firing is completed, the instructor commands open bolt. The squad leader checks to see that this is done. The instructor and squad leader then go forward to inspect the target and give each man the necessary correction based upon the location of the center of impact of his shot group for his next shot. As up one minute, right one half point, or for the service rifle, up 25, left one. The firing continues in this manner until all rifles are zeroed. That is, until each man has hit his aiming paster. In order to create competition between squads and to enable the instructor to grade their rally proficiency, exercises fired on the landscape target range should be scored. A scoring device made from wire or a scoring diagram on a sheet of transparent celluloid, each conforming in size to the 50% and 75% shot groups expected of average shots firing at 1,000 inches should be used for this purpose. After an exercise has been completed, the zones can be shown to the squad by applying the scoring device to the target. The following is a sequence of events in conducting firing exercises. 
the squad takes its place on the firing point. All members of the squad, except the squad leader, face to the rear. The instructor takes the squad leader to the panel and points out the target to him. The target in this exercise is a machine gun located at the base and between the two haystacks in the center of the wheat field. They return to the firing point where the squad leader takes charge of his squad. Ammunition for the problem is then issued. 25 rounds is the allowance for the problem. The automatic rifleman receives seven rounds and each rifleman receives three rounds. The squad leader causes the men to take their firing position. The sandbag rest is used only by the automatic rifleman and then only when armed with the automatic rifle. When the men are in position, the squad leader checks to see that all men have taken good position and are using the sling in the proper manner. The squad leader commands load. This fire order is then given. Range, 600. To your left front, two haystacks in center of wheat field. At base between haystacks, enemy machine gun. Fire at will. During the firing of the exercise, the squad leader is on the alert to see that all members of his squad are firing on the designated target. The squad leader may be required to switch the fire of the automatic rifleman to a surprise target. Keen interest, stimulated by competition, should prevail during the firing of these exercises. When the squad has completed firing, the squad leader commands, cease firing, open bolt. After he has checked to see that all bolts have been opened, the squad is taken forward to examine the target. The panel is scored and marked with a squad number. At the conclusion of any firing exercise, a critique is held in which the instructor states the object and purpose of the exercise, commends what is well done, and calls attention to what is poorly or incorrectly done, giving a correct solution where errors have occurred. He discusses the effect of the fire delivered. Remarks which might be harmful to interest, initiative, or cause dread of responsibility should be avoided. He should not leave the impression that there is only one correct method of solving the exercise. The used panel is removed and replaced with a new one. By means of these exercises, the technique of several important elements of musketry, target designation, fire distribution, fire control, and fire orders are taught. In later exercises, the principles taught here are applied to firing on field targets. Minotaur ranges may be improvised as an aid in musketry training. Caliber 22 rifles are used for firing on these ranges. Small cardboard silhouettes, colored olive drab, are used as the target. These are glued to small sticks, which fit into holes drilled into small wooden beams, which may be rotated 90 degrees exposing or concealing the target when cords are pulled by an operator. These ranges may be used for either indoor or outdoor training and require but a small amount of space. They may be landscaped to present any type of terrain desired. It is possible to portray movement, observe the effect of fire, exercise fire control, and present a variety of control targets, including aerial targets if desired. In firing musketry exercises on a range of this type, the interest of the men is awakened and sustained throughout the firing of the exercise 
and the leader is compelled to be constantly on the alert while exercising fire control. The characteristics of rifle fire and its effect are next explained to the soldier before he is permitted to do any field firing. When a bullet is fired from a service or an automatic rifle, it leaves the muzzle with an initial velocity of 2,700 feet per second. After leaving the muzzle of the rifle, it begins to encounter resistance from the air and its initial velocity is greatly decreased. This decrease together with the action of gravity, causes it to follow a curved path of flight, which is called the trajectory. Because of the great speed with which the bullet leaves the muzzle of the rifle, the trajectory at short ranges is nearly straight or flat. The trajectory at range of 700 yards does not rise above the height of a man standing. Increasing the range, causes a portion of the trajectory to rise above the height of a man standing, and the danger space is interrupted by this interval until the trajectory begins to lower to the height of a man standing. This results in the danger space being divided into two parts with an interval in between, the length of the interval being dependent upon the terrain. Due to the differences in ammunition, aiming, holding, and wind effects, a number of bullets fired from one rifle will not always follow the same path, but will disperse slightly. The trajectories form a cone-shaped figure called dispersion. The dispersion of the average shots with a rifle at various ranges is shown on these charts. 100 yards, 200 yards, 300 yards, 400 yards, 500 yards, 600 yards, 800 yards, 1,000 yards. When the cone of dispersion strikes a vertical target, the pattern it makes on the target is called a vertical shot group. When the cone of dispersion strikes a horizontal target, the pattern it makes on the target is called a horizontal shot group. Due to the flatness of the trajectory, horizontal shot groups have a length of from 100 to 400 yards, depending chiefly on the range. The greater the range, the shorter the shot group. The beaten zone is the ground struck by the bullet, forming a cone of dispersion. When the ground is level, the beaten zone is a horizontal shot group. Rising ground shortens the beaten zone. Ground that slopes downward and in the approximate curve of the trajectories will greatly lengthen the beaten zone. Frontal fire is fire delivered at right angles to the front of the enemy. Oblique fire is fire delivered at an objective from any direction other than the perpendicular to or parallel to either of its axes. Oblique fire is slightly more effective than frontal. Enfilade fire is fire delivered at an objective from or near the prolongation of its longer axes. For example, fire delivered from a point on or near the prolongation of the enemy's line. Flanking fire is fire delivered at an objective from the direction of its flank. Enfilade and flanking fire are more effective than oblique. Fire as regards trajectory is classed as follows. Grazing fire. 
plunging fire. Grazing fire is more effective than plunging fire because the beaten zone is much longer. Overhead fire. Overhead fire with a rifle is safe when the ground affords protection to the friendly troops in front or when they are sufficient distance below the line of fire. Signals most frequently used in fire control are range, commence firing, fire faster, fire slower, cease firing, fix bayonets. By making use of cover and the supporting fires of artillery and machine guns, rifle units will get as near the enemy as possible without opening fire. Normally, this should be at ranges less than 600 yards. Rifle fire is seldom used against materiel. However, rifle fire is effective and should be used against low-flying aeroplanes. The different kinds of targets that troops may expect to meet on the battlefield vary from advancing individuals and small groups to groups in defilated positions and in an irregular line or in concealed positions, where these targets are dispersed and echeloned in depth. Proper application of collective fire will be difficult. The enemy disposed in small groups must be located and engaged by fire before any advance can be made. In making an attack, the necessity for extended and irregular formation, echeloned in depth to take advantage of cover and concealment in order to prevent excessive losses, may make it difficult to occupy positions from which the fire of the entire unit can be controlled. Many times, the unit may not be able to open fire as a whole, but will have to build up fire gradually as individuals or small groups reach a firing position. In some cases, a target may only be visible to portions of the unit, while in other cases, an efficient, well-controlled fire can be delivered by the entire unit. Firing positions must be selected which provide a good field of fire to the front and which will permit control of fire by the unit leader. In occupying these positions, troops must make full use of cover and concealment and take formation which will fit the terrain and be hard to see. The fire of a rifle unit must be either distributed or concentrated depending upon the size and nature of the target engaged. The soldier must be taught the part he must play in these two kinds of fire. Distributed fire is fire distributed in width for the purpose of keeping all parts of a wide target under effective fire. Its use is habitual on wide targets and no special command for its use is contained in the fire order. In distributed fire, each rifleman fires his first shot on that portion of the target corresponding to his position in the squad. He then distributes his remaining shots over that part of the target extending to the right and left of his first shot. Unless otherwise instructed, the automatic rifleman will habitually cover the entire target, firing two or three shots semi-automatic fire each time before changing his point of aim. When the section is firing, each squad in the section covers the entire target without special command in the same manner as shown for the squad. The section leader may, however, direct his squads to cover only a small portion of the target. Concentrated fire is fire directed at a single point. This fire has great effect, but only at a single point. Hostile machine guns and automatic rifle groups are suitable targets for concentrated fire. 
the most effective rate of fire under existing conditions must not be exceeded. To exceed this rate, waste ammunition. In rapid fire practice, the soldier is trained to shoot from seven to 10 shots a minute at a clearly visible target, depending upon the range. In battle, targets are indistinct and a slower rate of fire is advisable. The high rate of fire of the automatic rifle, which may be fired at a rate of 40 to 60 shots per minute, makes it a very important weapon in maintaining firepower. Every effort must be made to keep automatic rifles in action. Their fire is particularly valuable against targets requiring the greatest volume of fire or to cover targets of greater area. In the event the automatic rifleman becomes a casualty, he is replaced by another member of the squad. Fire control is the regulation of rifle fire by squad and section leaders. It enables leaders to bring the fire of their units to bear on a designated target in the most effective manner. Orders and commands must be easily understood. All members of the unit must be familiar with signals used to control fire. These men, who have been appointed non-commissioned officers because they have displayed natural ability as leaders, are further trained in leadership. They must be able to estimate situations, make decisions, give commands to carry out these decisions, and most important of all, see that their units carry out the commands given. During musketry training, leaders are assembled and given instructions in combat principles of their unit so that these principles may be applied in carrying out their mission in various combat situations. Problems may be conducted on a sand table and individuals called upon to give oral solutions to the situations indicated. Further training in combat principles and leadership is conducted by means of tactical walks in which non-commissioned officers are required to give oral solutions to situations pointed out to them on the ground. Good leadership increases the morale of a unit, which is the basis of all infantry fighting power. The first instruction in firing at field targets must be individual. The soldier should be impressed with the fact that he must carry out the lessons learned in rifle marksmanship when he goes into the field. Hasty and unaimed fire is worse than useless. The hits on this target indicate that the fire has applied the lessons learned in rifle marksmanship. A soldier who fails to carry out the lessons learned in rifle marksmanship will not attain results. The soldier firing at this target did not carry out the lessons learned in rifle marksmanship and the fire team to which he belongs will be unable to efficiently use its firepower in battle. Assault fire is a type of fire sometimes used by assault units when within 150 yards of the enemy and when fire superiority has been obtained. Bayonets are fixed before taking up assault fire. Riflemen halt individually, aim and fire standing. Reload while advancing, advance a few steps, halt and fire straight to the front again. The automatic rifleman fires semi-automatic fire while advancing, 
distributing his fire along the enemy position within limits which will provide safety to the men on his right and left. The members of the squad are then trained in firing at moving targets to gain experience and the proper amount to lead a moving target in field firing exercises. The first collective field firing exercises are begun with fire units already deployed in firing positions. Lessons learned in the previous steps of musketry instruction are applied on simple field target setup in exercises similar to those fired on the landscape target range. Where limited terrain is available, field firing exercises may be conducted on known distance ranges. The targets can be set up in an irregular line, just in rear of the butt, and the advance be made from the firing point toward the butt. The members of the unit carry out the principles learned in extended order drill and scouting and patrolling and making the advance. As the men reach the butt, they take up good firing positions and engage the targets with collective fire. Field firing exercises may be simulated where terrain is so limited that firing cannot be permitted. The units go through the exercises just as though ammunition were being used. Umpires check the manner in which the advance is made to the initial firing position. They check on the manner in which the men take advantage of cover and concealment. The firing position selected and question individual members of the unit as to the target upon which they are simulating fire and the range to the target. When they consider satisfactory fire has been simulated upon the target, they may permit part of the unit to advance and continue in this manner until the exercise has been completed. Where terrain permits, service ammunition is fired in the exercises. The rifle unit is assembled in rear of the initial firing position where the situation for the field firing exercise is given. Such exercises are supervised by an officer known as the umpire. He presents the situation to the leader. He uses the necessary assistance to ensure safety during the fire. The squad leader thoroughly explains the situation to all men participating in the exercise. This is most important. To have two sites ready for emergencies, sites are habitually set at 300 yards when not in use. Battle site corresponds to a range of about 550 yards. While less accurate than the peep site, it may be used when firing at aeroplanes or when time does not permit setting the peep site. Service ammunition is issued to each member of the squad. The squad leader gives special instruction to the scouts about when to open fire in case the enemy is observed. A unit must be preceded by its scouts unless friendly troops are ahead. The scouts move forward and reconnoiter to locate the enemy. They form a protecting screen to prevent the squad from walking into dangerous areas. The scout observes to the front. The hill to the front looks dangerous. But seeing no enemy, he signals to the other scout to advance. Scouts work in pairs. In crossing the crest of a hill, one remains in a firing position until the other scout has passed over the crest. 
the squad leader observes to the front. No enemy has appeared, so he signals to his squad to move forward. The squad leader crawls forward, making use of cover to study the ground to the front and plan the best way to use his squad should the enemy appear. The hill to the front looks dangerous to the squad leader. His assumption was correct. A squad of the enemy has appeared, represented by field targets. The scouts have observed the enemy. They were instructed by the squad leader to estimate the range to the enemy and open fire with tracer bullets to determine the range. The scouts, having determined the range to the enemy, announce this range to the balance of the squad and point out the enemy flanks with tracer bullets. The squad leader sends the members of his squad to their firing position, gives them the range and location of the enemy so that they may engage the target with distributed fire. The squad leader checks up on the firing positions of his men and observes the effect of their fire. Men must not be allowed to bunch together behind concealment that does not afford protection from fire. On the range, the soldier is not permitted to rest his rifle against anything while firing, but in battle, he should take advantage of rocks, trees, or any other rest to make his fire more accurate. The automatic rifleman increases the accuracy of his fire by using a bipod mount. The loop sling may be used in battle to help steady the rifle, except in the standing position or when the situation requires readiness for immediate use of the bayonet or when emergencies demand immediate fire without time to adjust the sling. A machine gun target has appeared. The squad leader switches the fire of the automatic rifle to the machine gun target. This squad, by proper application and control of collective fire, has gained fire superiority. Following squad exercises, section exercises are similarly fired. First, the targets are fairly visible. In later exercises, the targets are more and more concealed. Finally, targets are practically concealed. Surprise targets are introduced, requiring the leader to shift all or part of his firepower. Moving targets, representing men advancing in various formations, are introduced into the exercises. Combat firing exercises are then fired with squad and section solving combat situations in the attack, defense, and service of security. A definite tactical principle should be involved and a specific lesson in fire tactics included in each problem. Fire alone does not win battles, but must be combined with movement, morale, and leadership. To defeat the enemy, firepower must be advanced. And finally, troops must close with a determined enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The fire units are now ready for their last phase of instruction, known as combat practice firing, where fire is combined with movement under competent leadership. The section leader decides to send his reserve squad 
through the woods on the right flank to bring flanking fire on the enemy. Upon receiving the order from the section leader, the squad leader leads his squad around the right flank, taking advantage of all available cover and concealment. This chart shows the route followed by this squad in relation to the section firing line and the enemy position. The firing squad is now in position. The sudden burst of fire from the flank takes the enemy by surprise. Fire is increased and the enemy is pinned to the ground enabling the rest of the section to resume its advance. Fire superiority has been obtained so that the enemy can no longer return an effective fire. The section leader, taking advantage of the situation, decides to close in. Bayonets are fixed individually so as to keep up the firepower of the unit and not lose fire superiority. The assault must be launched as soon as the enemy appears to be beaten or shows signs of giving up. The time has come for assault fire. This method is used to keep the enemy subdued until the advance is close enough to make a bayonet charge. The automatic rifleman fires while walking but the riflemen halt individually, fire every few steps or when targets appear. The squads have closed in on the enemy. They still hold on. When enemy troops fail to be moved from their position by fire, the bayonet assault will do it. Successful squad and section exercises have been completed due to the proper application of fire and movement of the combat units under competent leadership of the non-commissioned officers in command.